Let's go. All right. Hello, everyone. Good to see you all again. Thanks. We're gonna we're gonna get started. So can everyone quiet down a little bit, please? All right. So anyway, this week um, we will be talking about scalability and pretty much the precise reason why we aren't able to pay with like Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and use that to pay for a cup of coffee. So that's kind of the mindset that I'd like you to take for this lecture. Just think about why we don't see it being used at like for like really quick like maybe small transactions. So we will get into that and we'll pass it off to Ava to kick it off. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, today we have kind of a shorter lecture. We think we don't have too many slides to go over, so we'd really appreciate a lot of engagement. We have some questions here for you all. Try to ask what kind of questions if you ever get confused, um, but basically a quick rundown of what we're gonna be going over today. I'm gonna give a background of scalability, kind of why do we even have this lecture here, um, and then we're gonna jump into use cases and different, um, different ways you can actually implement scalability and the pros and cons of each, and then JJ's gonna finish this off and talk about where scalability is today um, with different protocols. So giving a quick background of what the problem is with scalability, does anyone want to give a definition of scalability or what they think the scalability problem would mean? Or if they, if they know what scalability is, then they can say that too. Yes? Having more transaction throughput on the blockchain without compromising uh, the the attribute, uh, you can what do you call it, properties of the blockchain, yeah, preferably. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. So having more transaction throughput. One definition. Anyone else? Or even you can just talk about what scalability means, like outside of the context of blockchain. Yes. Just the overall expansion and adaptation of the blockchain, um, including new uses that maybe aren't even existing yet. <laughs> totally, totally. So increasing adoption overall. Anyone else? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> All right, cool. Yeah, those are those are great answers, and we'll get into more definitions and what scalability means within the context of blockchain. Um, but basically, this meme, if you have tried to use the Ethereum network for transactions, you'll see that gas prices are really, really high. Um, does anyone know what a WEI is, by the way? W-E-I? I don't know if we've covered that in this class. A WEI is the smallest unit of Ethereum. So in Bitcoin, if you've heard of a Satoshi, a Satoshi is the smallest unit of a Bitcoin. A WEI is the smallest unit of an Ethereum, fun fact. Um, okay, so the goal is to provide all the services that a blockchain offers to all users independent of how many users there are. So you can still function as a blockchain, still do everything that you want to do with really high volume users. Uh, something that people use when they talk about scalability is TPS, which is transactions per second. Um, so if we want to compare Bitcoin to traditional payment systems, it's kind of embarrassing. So Bitcoin can, on average, handle three transactions per second. PayPal can handle 150, Visa can handle 2,000. So if three people want to buy coffee at the same second, like, and they want to pay with Bitcoin, all of them, that's the maximum number of users that Bitcoin can handle, which obviously is a problem, so that's why we want to figure out how to make Bitcoin more scalable. Um, and we last week we talked about L1 and L2, so this is what we were referring to when we said it last week. It's layer one versus layer two, and whenever you hear L1, L2, that's generally referring to scalability within blockchains. So a layer one uh, refers to the main blockchain architecture. Whenever, one's, whenever anyone says that's an L1 solution, that means that that's a change that has been made to the blockchain architecture itself that is intended to improve scalability. So if you're changing the way the Bitcoin blockchain fundamentally works or the Ethereum blockchain fundamentally works, that's what we call a layer one solution. A layer two solution refers to the secondary framework or protocol that's built on top of the existing blockchain. So you can think of it as an L2 solution is a change that has been made off chain to improve scalability. L1 is a change that has actually affected the way the blockchain itself works. Um, so when you're thinking about these two things, you can sort of imagine that layer one is much, much harder to achieve and there's a lot of restrictions when it comes to what you can do on a, with a layer one solution because you're actually changing um, 
the infrastructure and the way that the blockchain works. Whereas with a layer two solution, you're able to, you have a lot more leeway, a lot more flexibility with what you can do because you're not actually changing the infrastructure itself. And a lot of the use cases that we go over um, throughout this lecture are going to be dealing, we're gonna go over first layer one solutions and then layer two solutions. And so this is the scalability triangle. We've gone over trilemmas before in this class, I think with the cap theorem, if you remember, we also had a triangle for consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. And it was like two or three lectures ago. So this is another trilemma. This is a really big trilemma. I think Daniel was touching on this when he, with his answer of transaction throughput. You wanna maintain transaction throughput, but you also want to, um, you don't wanna compromise any of the two other parts of this triangle, so security and decentralization. So this is called the scalability triangle because it's used in relation to scalability because as we want to increase the number of users on a network or be able to handle a higher volume of transactions, oftentimes we have to consider what we're willing to give up to do that. And so a really easy um, you know, example of this is in the hash puzzle. If you wanna say, okay, well, because Bitcoin can only handle three transactions per second, let's just make the hash puzzle super easy and so then we can handle more transactions because more blocks are gonna be made. Um, but then you can easily see that you're compromising security then, right? Because if the hash puzzles become really easy, you get a, a ton of blocks coming into the network and not everyone can verify all the blocks that are coming in. Um, so even though you're moving down this triangle here towards scalability, you're compromising security. And so you, you can think of the way that you're moving on this triangle, it's somewhere within the area of the triangle is where you're gonna fall. Any questions? That was a quick background and then we're gonna jump into actual solutions. Awesome, okay. All right, so we'll kick it off with some layer one examples. So let's explain one, what they are and how they are used and going to be used in the future. So just to start with layer one, has anyone heard of any layer one scaling solutions? And just like Ava said, as a reminder, this refers to changing the underlying protocol versus a, of like a blockchain. Has anyone heard of any examples of layer one? Yeah. Increasing block size, definitely. No. Anyone else? No. Yeah, so change in the consensus mechanism, so Ethereum switching the proof of stake, definitely. Anyone else? No. Maybe one more, has anyone heard of any others? <laughs> You've heard of some layer two? Okay, well, we, you will learn about a uh, few more right now. No, no hands? <laughs> okay. So the first that we'll bring up is called Taproot. And so this is something that we'll see, um, that we'll see something like this being implemented really soon, but I'll talk a little more about that in a sec. So pretty much before Taproot, here's, here's some, of the, some of the underlying issues. So the first idea is we use signatures in the verification process of transactions. And this process a lot of times is really slow because from time to time you might need a lot more, you might need like a large number of signatures to actually be able to verify some kind of transaction. And it is required pretty much everywhere in the network to verify these transactions. You need these signatures from all the different participants. And so we have these two main cases involved here. Our first is when we are validating a new block, we need signatures. And then when a node newly connects or reconnects the network. So anytime there is any entry to the network, you also need to provide your signature. And we can remember, we recall that signatures pretty much relate back to the idea of like public and private keys. Like this is how, this is like a way that you can represent your signature is through your public key. And um, another problem before Taproot also, we see that users were able to see a lot of these details that are meant to be private. So at least with these transaction details, so all scripts um, are before Taproot were public and pretty open for anyone who wants to check them out. So with time we saw a, a creation of this new type of signature called a Schnorr signature and what we see for starters is it's based off of the Bitcoin improvement protocol. And so this gets back into why it is a later, layer one, because it is something that will be implemented on the Bitcoin, like the underlying, just like, to, uh, sorry, it will be implemented to Bitcoin as a whole, and it will be become an improvement protocol that will be applied to increase, to kind of help with scalability and allow for more, and like just more efficient transaction time and more transactions. So 
What, uh, so what Taproot does, um, it combines the shore signature and then this idea of mast, Merkleized abstract um, syntax trees. And that's pretty much just like a data structure. It's a way to organize their information into smaller groups so that it's easier to sort them or kind of pull them if you need smaller pieces of information. So just like, I mean, I don't know if any of you have really heard about the idea of like container storage, which is talking more about storage, but it's ways to kind of to split big groups of information into smaller components and then we can list them and store them more um, effectively when it comes to actually us needing to pull this information or use it. So Taproot will replace like kind of the industry standard ECDSA signatures with SNOR signatures and the few benefits with this um, is that there's key aggregation. So if someone has a lot of different uh, public keys that they interact with, they're able to all be condensed into one and then that one key is able to be used. And it is, you can also see that Schnorr allows for verification in linear time. So this opens up the door for a lot of different kind of key aggregation type benefits, but it pretty much just allows us to, to do a lot more on, yeah, just a lot, lot more with uh, Bitcoin. And so I won't get into that too much, but it just provides a lot of benefits when it comes to keys. and. And then that saves a lot of time and space, so it works out well, too. Because if you think about it, the more signatures you have, the longer it's going to take to actually have to verify these signatures and work with them. So that's one of the benefits we see here. And actually, some more benefits <laughs> going on to the next slide. So we see that for starters, we have, we're able to have multiple signers in a transaction so that we can create like an aggregate public key. So it's combining all the public keys and signatures so that it's, for, for all intents and purposes, we see that uh, this big group of signatures can all be compiled into one. And that also goes with, that's really effective because it saves us a lot of time and it saves a lot of heavy lifting that can be sped up in a way that just m makes for smooth sailing. Uh, we also have, uh, yeah, so like even talking about savings, it could be from anywhere from like 30 to 75%, which is I mean, pretty su substantial. And then getting into batch validation, so uh, kind of verifying all these signatures. So batch validation pretty much just like it says here, it's a process in which many signatures can be verified at once. And it's a lot faster than having to go through and individually verify each of these transactions or signatures. And so, we see like a, a logarithmic growth um, in the time that it, or like that it, in the time that it takes to verify more signatures. So it can take. We see that the more signatures we have, the faster it could be. And and the kind of last point here is that when a transaction has many scripts, they don't actually need to be revealed. So information that we want to be kept private can actually be kept private through this bundling mechanism here. And then. Uh, kind of going off that last point, we have more privacy. So like transaction types look just the same as regular transactions. So people's signatures, scripts, whatever it may be, those are all kind of disguised and presented as just the same as any other regular transaction. So it's they're able to be pretty incognito with the way that they're included in, in the blockchain. And nec uh, next it is, yeah, and we see like in terms of like blo uh, block, broad uh, block broadcasting, all scripts in a certain transaction aren't, this aren't broadcast. So they aren't public for everyone involved in the network to all the nodes there. And so what this allows for, and like we talked about with logarithmic growth, we're able to be much more efficient with a larger number of, of signatures. And so that's where like this K of N is just our terminology that we use that refers to like a, a large number of signatures. And we can use much larger scripts. And we'll get into scripts a little more in a second, but we're able to kind of expand the horizon of what we're working with and do this in a more efficient amount of time. And so it's just a little update on Taproot. So Taproot is scheduled to kind of be uh, implemented in mid-November 2021. So be on the lookout. That's going to come up well, I mean, during the semester. So we'll see how that changes transaction times and scalability. So keep, yeah, keep your eye out on this. Hey, does anyone have any questions here? Bitcoin, Bitcoin, yeah. Anyone else? Okay, and I think, I know there was a lot, so I'll, and I'll get to your question in one second, but pretty much the main takeaway here is it allows you to take a lot of different signatures and compile them into one kind of like 
into one signature. And for all intents and purposes, you're able to interact with that signature that encompasses all these, anywhere like hundreds, thousands, however many signatures involved, just like it is one signature, which is why it saves so much space and time. Yeah. Is there something similar to Ethereum, or is it not unique? Is there something similar to Ethereum? Um, it, I'm trying to think. Um, well, we'll talk about some other things that are applied to Ethereum in a minute, but I think because of the shift of proof of, actually, I'm not entirely sure. I'm not fully sure. Oh yeah, so we're gonna get into roll-ups. I'm trying to think if there's something that's more, yeah, like Z, yeah. so that's ZK Snarks before to um, zero knowledge, sus succinct, non, wait, was it zero knowledge, succinct? Snarks, well, I'm just trying to think of, well, okay, well, we'll get into that later. Or Maybe we won't. If you have questions about like zero knowledge proofs, um, that kind of falls a little more into DeFi, but well, it's a way that Ethereum is able to use, kind of keep information private. So it talks about privacy a little bit in DeFi. Non-interactive. Oh yeah, succinct, a snark is a succinct non-interactive argument of not. Sorry, I'm forgetting, that. I'm forgetting an acronym right now, but I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Sweet, so now we'll get into the idea of segregated witness. And so, and also, this is also known as SegWit. And it's a little bit of a combination between layer one and layer two, because, and we'll see why in a second, but just a, br a basic overview of it. It takes your, so we know that with, we need witnesses and we need like signatures with, to help with our tra like transaction validation process. And so, Normally, this like kind of the witnesses interact within the network, but what we're able to do here is make a protocol change where, for starters, we take the witness outside of our realm and apply it to, in a way outside of the blockchain, and that's ki that's kind of why it's both layer one, layer two. It's layer one because it changes the protocol to have this witness be external to the system, and then it's layer two because it is something that is done outside of the blockchain, and that's like kind of by definition what is that's what makes something layer two. So a few of the problems we had before SegWit, um, we see one, for starters, we have this idea of like transaction malleability. And this just refers to the fact that with every transaction we have, there is this kind of like waiting period between like when blocks are confirmed. So blocks do need to be confirmed for them, for the transactions to go through, and there is this like time period where n like we're getting these, um, we're getting verification that this transaction is true. And so what we see with this, and even with the idea of different like script versioning, you, um, the pr problem with malleability is that people are able to change parts of their identity, maybe parts of their like uh, IDs somehow, or like part of their, um, yeah, pretty much just part of their identity so that it, they are not able to, not, not uh, maybe, sorry, I'll, I'll kind of give an example like this. Imagine that you pay for like a hundred dollar, you spend a hundred dollars and you call your credit card company and say, you didn't actually pay for something. So it's, there's a way, because there is this middle ground between, um, that's just not a good way to explain it. Okay, sorry everyone. Um, okay, let's just go with this. Pretty much, you're ab um, there's kind of some conf um, contradiction between what, you're, uh, between what has been done, like a transaction that's been done, and what you say. So imagine right now, if I, if I Venmo JJ $10 right now, but then I go to Venmo and say, for some reason, like this transaction wasn't me, this was falsified somehow, then there's this contradiction between what actually happened, where I actually did pay him, and what I'm saying. And because of this, if I change my, like parts of my identity on that is what is public to our greater network, then there's some kind of confusion around what actually happened, and there's confusion as to what like Venmo, let's say, should, like what the Venmo should believe. And so that's where the idea of malleability comes in, is that we have this ability to kind of change parts of our identity to falsify that transactions happened or didn't happen. And then getting into script versioning, so just we see a lot of efficiency, a lot of redundant computation done, at least with like hashing operations, and like even with our script versioning, which I won't get into too much, but just the overall system, because it requires so much redundant work, it takes a lot of time and space, and it's, there are ways that we can cut down on this to make it more, uh, more efficient. And finally, we have like signature data once it's been released once, then it can oftentimes be traced back to a certain person or a public key. And because of that, this data is everywhere and pretty public, so it removes some of the privacy involved from witnesses. So this is kind of like, we'll just look at a little um, code snippet right here to compare the difference between 
like a witness between, uh, with a witness and like a segregated witness, um, which is just how we have it being like kind of external to the system. So as we see on here, on our top, we look at before, everything is all condensed and kind of kept in that one transaction. And like the script sig right here is um, all, it's all within the realm of that one transaction bundle. But that being said, we're able to create, we're able to um, take this witness information and list it externally, so like outside of our blockchain. And because of that, then this information is private within this transaction here. So there's no exact information about the witness. We just know that there is a witness and there is a signature involved. So it privatizes this information here. So some ways that this works, we, so we've talked about Merkle trees a little bit, but what we can do too is create two si pretty much si like identical trees with the big difference being that one of the trees has kind of lists transactions and the other lists signatures. And so if we look at these two trees side by side, we should be able to trace exactly which, like where the signatures are applied, which witnesses apply to which transactions and kind of how everything works but they're listed and they're separate from the transaction. So by creating two trees and just mirroring one and then creating that and then throwing that in the Merkle, in Merkle root instead, we will have a tree of transactions and a tree of the signatures. And so now just to get into script versioning a little bit. So I know I mentioned this a little bit on the first slide of the section. So scripts are pretty much a set of instructions. So it's a series of op codes, which are just like operational codes that tell that tell the user of the system what to do. And it just it's essentially just a way to represent instructions. And to implement changes, it's sometimes you have to or what you have to do is replace like an op code with a new one. And so you'll need to completely override these instructions, which can take a lot of time or a lot of space. And what we saw in Segwit is that like I've any of you heard of like you'll hear about like an app update, you'll hear like 5.0.1 or something like there's, we see like a number it's incremented somehow to represent like a newest update or a newest change to an app. Has anyone heard of that or something like that? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, great. I'm glad, I'm glad you've heard of it, Alva. Yeah, so by using numbers instead, it's a way to kind of update changes and create a very systematic method of replacing opcodes. And so it makes upgrades a lot faster and easier. And then the other idea we'll get into is the idea of signature hashing. This is just, I mean, as we've talked a lot about hashing in this class, but it's the idea that a lot of times there is a lot of redundant computation or hashing that goes on. And so by, we can reduce this issue and we can save a lot of time by hashing only like twice versus four times and so just it just cuts it's just a way that we can trim things and it was initially done for safety and security but of course we have to sacrifice a little bit of security if we want greater scalability okay um and just a quick quick few um few quick pros and cons of segwit for starters so for pros it fixes transaction malleability malleability which is the idea that like you can kind of falsify if transactions actually happen or not, and it creates clarity around transactions that happen. So by having a segregated witness or an external witness, then th we'll ha we have a lot more clarity into transactions that actually happen. Um, it, cre it can create a soft fork, um, and why this is effective is because it's backwards compatible, and we're able to work, and so we talked about forking earlier, but it just helps us to, it's just, it it's backwards compatible, meaning we're able to work um, older systems can work on it. It's, it's pretty much universally available to anyone, like, and anyone can work on these updates versus a hard fork, which requires like, a forced update to be pushed to the network. And increases efficiency and block size, and overall, it just creates a more succinct size of the blockchain. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and then a few cons, pretty much in general, it requires everyone to be on board. And so what these three points demonstrate is that it, well, while it does make things a little bit better, it, we need to keep in, the, keep in mind that miners, developers, and users all might have to make changes to the, like make some pretty substantial changes to be able to work in this way. Because like, even like a protocol change, if you think about it, people have developed different software or different kind of solutions to help them better interact. So like at least miners may have developed like their physical hardware to optimize for a certain kind of Bitcoin mining. But if we see like whatever kind of mining it is or whatever kind of interaction or role we have, people have things that are developed to, that are like optimized for a certain 
type of network, and when we make these changes to the underlying protocol, then they might have to change their own optimizations that they made. So it's not always easy for people involved, so like developers and miners, and just overall users to adjust to these changes that we make. Uh, yeah, so I think that's about it from that section. Any questions there? All right, uh, if any come up, feel free to ask in the next section, but we'll, we're gonna head into layer two. Wait, oh no, we have sorry, one more section. Um, we're gonna talk about sharding. So this is the last idea. This is actually my favorite layer one solution, and it's pretty intuitive in my opinion. Pretty much it's just the idea that, well, if we have a giant blockchain network, if we have a bunch of nodes, why are we all doing so much redundant computation? And so a way to speed things up is if we split, let's say we just have a thousand nodes in a network and we have a few transactions going on, well, why don't we have half the network work on half of these transactions and the other half work on the other half? And what that does is it just allows us to double our time and we have less people that are actually verifying and we essentially create two smaller, like, uh, succinct, or like two smaller independent blockchain networks they're like groups that will, are working to verify, but it allows us to do twice as much. And so that's where we have, like when we do have a lot of really large groups that are working on the same thing, if we split them into smaller groups, they'll be able to get more done. And that's the main idea for it. So pretty much uh, every, every miner doesn't really need to be working on every single block. If we split it well and create and work in parallel, then we can get more done. And so that's where we kind of create some more node categories and so We'll have these different node types, so like super full, top level, single shard, and light nodes that all work, and they might work on different, like certain subgroups, they might be working on everything, but what it does is it allows us to create different distinctions for types of nodes so that we, so that they can pretty much, pretty much optimize time and then allow for more, a kind of just faster transaction output and just greater scalability. And so some of the challenges that come with this are that one, if we have cross shard communication, there's a lot of, it's really difficult to communicate and sometimes, like we saw with distributed systems, when you have a bunch of different groups that are all working to achieve the same goal, it's difficult to sync them all up and create like one shared global clock or whatever it may be because there is no global clock. And so c communication, there are a lot of times communication uh, uh, issues can be problematic. And if we have a single shard takeover, so if we have like a single shard or like subgroup that's all working and they, I mean because these are all nodes with different incentives, they might want to act maliciously or find a way to, and then yeah, just might not work in the way that optimizes sharding in the way that it's meant to be uh, implemented. So you know, what that's just saying is it doesn't always, things don't always work out as they're expected. Any questions about sharding there? Okay, sweet, so now we'll get into some layer two solutions. I'll pass it off to JJ. So now, we'll, um, sorry my voice is a little gone. Uh, today we'll talk about layer two solutions, which are off-chain solutions, which, um, <coughs> excuse me, I didn't know my voice was gonna be uh, so hoarse, but uh, they're off-chain solutions so they don't affect the actual underlying infrastructure itself. So, uh, a question for you guys, what layer two solutions have you heard of? Okay. Any others? Lightning Network, okay, awesome. Okay, next slide is Lightning Network. Recall every transaction is put onto the blockchain and there's a six block confirmation time which is a one hour wait time. Each transaction has a transaction fee, so it's inconsistent and non-economic for low value items, which makes micropayments and a lot of the adoption of the tokens themselves a lot more difficult. So we have the idea of the Lightning Network, which is don't put every transaction onto the blockchain. Can Alice and Bob make payments between themselves without always needing to put it on, on the chain? What if Alice and Bob have a private balance sheet and that private balance sheet is updated with every payment? Uh, they only need to consult the blockchain when they want to settle that balance so they can use that um, off-chain database to keep track of an internal ledger between themselves 
and then only settle it on chain at the end, which allows you to save a lot of transactions on the chain. Uh, here's the diagram. Alice sends money to Charlie through this hypothetical payment network. And the pros are people can make payments instantly, assuming they have enough money. You don't need to wait for any confirmation time. It only uses the um, Ethereum blockchain to s settle disputes and close out payment channels, which is super efficient. And you only pay transaction fees on the, those opens and closes. So you can go from three to around 10,000 TPS on those Lightning Network um, transactions. The cons are that nodes need to keep a large amount of capital locked up in payment channels and there's risk of centralization since only nodes that have enough capital to run the payment channels for an extended amount of time will be able to do that uh, which has a tendency towards a hub and spoke topology where we have these hubs that have a lot of tokens and they have a lot of um, payment channels that other people maybe don't have access to are there any questions on this part Uh, next, we're going to talk about optimistic rollups and CO, which means we do data storage on chain and computation off chain. And a really important thing to keep in mind when designing blockchain products, uh, when you're going through the design stage, is what data and what transactions you want to do on chain and what data you can put off chain. Because the more you put off chain, the better. Um, computation on the blockchain is really expensive, and you want to avoid doing things that are unnecessary on chain. So. Um, this employs fraud proofs to verify the correctness of the off-chain computation. Um, it supports more complex operations like smart contracts. There's several implementations already launched. Examples are Optimism and Arbitrum. Uniswap v3 will also be on Optimism. A second form of rollups, which is zero knowledge or ZK rollups, use zero knowledge proofs to validate the rollup state instead of fraud proofs provides less of an increase in scalability than other solutions like a Lightning Network. So here's the triangle. When we were, we kind of um, brought up a similar triangle in an earlier week when we were talking about the trade-offs when designing a blockchain solution. And you can't, as you move towards any one corner of the triangle, you have to lose another one. So that's what we see here. As you move towards scalability, you sacrifice a little bit of security in terms of not everything being on chain, and you sacrifice a little bit of decentralization in terms of not everything being validated by all the people in the network and you having those kind of hub and spoke approach. So uh, the same applies when you go in the other directions. We have all those trade-offs. Are there any questions on this part? Uh, layer two solutions in general, or Lightning Network, or optimistic growth. Uh, layer two in general provides an increase in scalability because with layer one solutions, we're making changes to the blockchain itself. So when you're on the Bitcoin network, everything is on the blockchain, and that requires all the miners in the network to validate it. And as we kind of talked about earlier, it's a really expensive operation. And having everyone have to validate all those transactions, as you have more and more transactions, it becomes more and more computationally expensive. You have more servers around the world running this code. Um, they're consuming more power. And it isn't generally, my opinion, is like Bitcoin is obviously the gold standard and it's here to stay. but when we see a lot of the adoption coming in the coming years, I think it'll be in things like Ethereum and Avalanche and Polkadot that we mentioned earlier um, in earlier lectures because we talked about how they're gonna have proof of stake, how proof of stake is gonna increase the time of finality, how it's going to increase the, um, or it's gonna lower the energy uses. Those will increase the scalability of these platforms. And like that's a layer one change is the, um, change to the proof, change to proof of stake. So change of proof of work to proof of stake on Ethereum is a layer one change, and a layer two change is where you're going to do computation off the blockchain. So you're going to use a traditional database, and you're going to do some computation that's not on the blockchain. And because it's not on the blockchain, we're not wasting all this power, and we're not wasting all this energy validating it, and that allows us to scale much faster because those uh, traditional database systems are what things like um, like the, the current internet, like Instagram, Netflix, Google, it's all run on a traditional web application architecture with a traditional database, and those databases are very quick. 
Um, so that's why it provides scalability. Uh, one other thing I want to mention is Polkadot uh, has the idea of pair chains, and those pair chains are another way to spread the computation. Each pair chain is identical to the original chain, but it's a way to ease the burden on the network. Uh, scalability is a modern problem, and advancements are happening as we speak. Uh, as we were discussing earlier, ETH 2.0 and the rollout in the first quarters of next year is uh, really exciting and is going to be a huge benefit to scalability in blockchain. It'll, it'll I think, be a huge um, catalyst for adoption. Thank you. Is there, is there any last questions before I end the lecture? All right, awesome. Do you guys? Oh, yeah. How do you what? Yeah, so that's the thing about these solutions is it's a, that's why it's layer two. It's a layer on top of the blockchain. And as we were talking about with Lightning Network, there is built-in security in the fact that um, if someone runs out of money, you settle it on chain. So anytime someone disres like defaults or acts maliciously on that off chain interaction, the contract can call it back and it'll settle on the chain. Um, so yeah, the, it's still secure because I, although we have trade-offs, it's not quite as secure, not quite as decentralized. Uh, they're not rolling things out to Ethereum that are, aren't secure because of like the scale it's at, the, the, the changes that they roll out at this point are um, like really well tested. Yeah, less of an increase than things like parachains and things like um, Lightning Network, but they still do provide uh, an increase in scalability. Yeah, it's just not as much. It's just the, um, the point of that bullet. All right, thank you guys so much for coming out today. Uh, appreciate you guys still showing up strong this late in the semester. Yay! <laughs> Google. Attendance code. Do it right now. Sharding. Yeah. Sharding. With the D. Mm -hmm. Sharding. Yep. All right. Yeah. And then um, the quiz this week's pretty tricky. So um, uh, sorry. It's uh, hopefully pretty. Hopefully everything will be in the slides. Um, and if there's anything that you have questions about, you can always just look it up to check. Um, we, you get you get a week to do the quizzes. So if you're doing the quiz and you are really confused on a question or something, email us. Yeah, there's no time limit on it too. So just make sure if you open it and email us, don't close it. So. And look at the slides because the answers are usually in the slides. Yeah. Check the slides. Uh, mm -hmm. There's also been interest in doing office hours. Um, so we might start doing that next week. Like just, we might be sitting at Strata for an hour on a Thursday or a Friday, and you guys can stop by, but we haven't finalized a time that works for both of us yet, so stay tuned, but that's in the works. All right, thank you guys. Thanks everyone.